Hello everybody, Samir, Engineer, MBA, and Investor. In today's video, I wanna talk about the latest updates for clinical trials in the year of 2022. This year, the latest updates of clinical trials. I wanna talk about all of that in this video using this article from Mrs. Hope Henderson on Innovative Genomics Institute. We've covered this article few weeks ago, I think it was like last week, actually we covered it and I gave my input about how they completely omitted Caribou Biosciences. But this video is gonna be actually about the article itself and about the latest updates and the latest clinical trial updates that we have in the CRISPR landscape. Beautiful video to come for you guys. But before we do that, before we jump into today's video, you guys gonna drill, like this video, smash that like button, destroy that like button, really does help the channel. YouTube algorithms, you guys know how they work. If you've not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? Lots of you watch our videos but are not subscribed, so consider subscribing and then hit the notification bell for our video to get to you faster. So, like I said, this article was posted a couple of weeks ago, actually on March 29th, so that's two weeks ago basically. And uh, Hope Henderson here, that we've covered her articles in the past on this website. Uh, has done an amazing job, an amazing job covering the genomics, specifically the CRISPR field. Uh, and what she did here is actually she went over all the clinical trials happening right now in this space, whether that's from a public or private company, and sort of try to bro break it down to make it easy for the audience here to read and to understand. Now, again, just as a reminder, she did miss out certain details like Caribou Biosciences on CAR T cells, but I have a separate video covering that. If you're interested in that, check out our video catalog. But in this video here, I wanted to go over the latest updates, right? So obviously clinical trial basics, I mean, you know, as a reminder, every company has to go through this process, right? If you want, the end goal is to have a FDA approved drug in the US, right? In the US, the regulatory body is called the FDA. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration. In Canada, it's Health Canada. In Europe, it's EMA. And in other regions around the world, you have different regulatory bodies. But in US, specifically US, because obviously this is where the market is right now, as you are going from a private research side of things to a public, uh, this is where commercial opportunities are. US has a huge market, of course. Uh, but that doesn't mean that Europe and Canada and other regions don't have a market. Obviously, they have a market. We'll take a look at some of the trials happening in some of these places as well, including it in my home country in Canada. So uh, phase one, phase two, phase three, right? So there's the whole process of, you know, in, in science, in, in these types of research, where you go from IND filing, right? You basically submit your papers, you get it all uh, submit it and then you get it approved to basically start your clinical trial. You enter in phase one, phase two, and then phase three is like your final stage of your trial. And obviously these types of phases take months and years, right? So you don't go from phase one to phase three within like, you know, three months, right? Uh, it takes years actually. Actually the only company, CRISPR company that is in phase three right now is actually CRISPR Therapeutics with CTX001. Every other company is either in phase one or phase two or hasn't even filed for IND in some cases, right? So clearly here, clearly here, there's still a lot, a lot of runway there for a lot of these companies. Uh, but the first uh, disease, obviously, that I want to talk about is the blood disorders, so sickle cell disease, beta thalassemia. And there are obviously a lot of players in this space, uh, whether that's CRISPR therapeutics, whether that's uh, their partnership with, of course, with Vertex, or that is uh, Beam Therapeutics with one of their Beam 101 program that they have yet to dose anybody. Um, we have Graphite Bio, which is a completely mess, but obviously they're in this space as well. So there's a couple of companies in this space. I think he, over here, uh, Henderson is talking about uh, the clinical trials, and we also have Victoria Gray and Jimmy interviews across the web. In fact, our own channel covered Jimmy um, interview two days ago, if you guys remember, I published that. I highly advise you guys to watch it. Like I said, it's an amazing interview. What is it better to just hear from the patient directly, right? Forget about me, forget about investors, forget about these companies, just hear from the patients directly, right? I just think it's amazing. And obviously, CRISPR Therapeutics and Vertex has a couple clinical trials, not just in US, but in Canada, Europe. 
Uh, and actually in Europe and US, the this treatment has been given fast special status to fast track approval, right? So this is the designation, orphan designation on, on those types of uh, uh, designations given by the regulatory bodies. It's basically to say, look, we have these patients that are not treated yet. There is no alternative cure. Uh, so we're going to reduce delays, reduce costs to you guys to give you guys priority to tackle these patients, specifically these patients first, right? So that's the whole process. That's the whole motivation. I think it's a win-win for both sides, uh, not just for these companies, but also for society, right? You actually have a organization that is inspired and motivated. And of course, uh, that is working actively to treat those specific patients that in the community otherwise would not be treated or at least addressed without the intervention, intervention of government bodies such as the FDA, right? Right, so there's that mention of graphite bio here. So, uh, so a couple of great things here. Um, so let's move on to the cancers part. So cancers obviously is a huge space. I mean, this is to me. I think this is where the money is at. If you want to talk about investing, um, investors are just looking at the space. There's a reason why there's so many players in this, including Beam Therapeutics, but obviously Caribou Biosciences with their CBO 10 program and also CBO 11 program that they just published the data poster that I covered uh, yesterday's video. Clearly cancers, you know, there's so many cancers out there, so many patients with cancers and chemotherapy. I've always used that analogy. It's basically just taking a hammer and hitting the car until, you know, the car is fixed, right? Which doesn't make sense, but it may or may not solve it. Most likely will not solve it. That's the problem with chemotherapy and with alternative treatments with individuals with cancers today. Yes, it may cure it, but you know, you're gonna lose hair, you're gonna destroy healthy cells, you're gonna introduce other unintended consequences. It just doesn't make sense, right? I, what do you do when your car has an issue, right? You actually diagnose the car and you go to the specific sensor, the specific part that is defective and you fix it. That's what CRISPR allows you to do. That's what CAR T cells is all about. CAR T cells, you want to make them last longer in the body. You want to make them persistent in the body to fight against cancer cells. So these healthy cells, these cells that can combat against cancer cells can last long in the body. That's how you genome edit it. Uh, in this case, Caribou Biosciences are doing that with CBO10, CBO11. Uh, again, watch our previous video from yesterday to find out what they're doing about that. But uh, clearly, here's just a couple of uh, spaces, a couple of companies that are tackling this, couple of organizations. And over here, um, like I said, she, unfortunately, Henderson did not include Caribou in there. Uh, and I know I mentioned this three times already, but it's just, I, I just have to mention it, right? Because it's literally a company that has patient, those many patients so far and, and will disclose data in this year alone for the CBO10. Um, but there's obviously some other organizations like the Chinese trial at Sinchuan University. Uh, you got that and you got a couple of others. Actually, there's a lot of players in this. Uh, there's Tana Biotechnology that obviously don't have clinical trials, but uh, they're big on CAR-T, actually natural killer cells as well. So uh, we're going to we're gonna move here. And uh, obviously there's CRISPR therapeutics with CTX110 that are obviously tackling this space as well. They've got given data for their complete response. Uh, I actually think it's average. And to me, if average is good, we'll get it FDA approved. In my opinion, that's my opinion. I think the data was good, but I don't know. Other people have other opinions on it. So it is what it is. Markets will do their markets, right? I don't know. So genetic blindness. I won't stay too much here, but uh, there's obviously one company that is tackling genetic blindness. A blind list and it is actually the first company that actually those patients in the space and that unfortunately has been having a lot of leadership issues that is added has. they're obviously doing it with edit 101 i think data was sub average in my opinion i think it was okay but it's not really conclusive yet it's not really clear what's the direction whether this is going to go towards an fda approved direction or not whether this is acceptable you know i think there's still a lot of data to be to be analyzed, there's still a lot of more months to be looked at for this program, but uh, clearly they're doing something novel. And I just love the fact that Editas is, you know, doubling down on the idea of tackling a genetic blindness uh, disease that other companies are not, right? And there's a reason why other companies are not doing that because, you know, eyes, a retinol, a retin uh, is very, very hard to tackle. And um, fortunately for us, we have at least one company that's tackling it, but whether or not they'll be uh, successful, that is another topic for another day. 
Diabetes, obviously, we know there's a big pharma company tackling it, Vertex, with their own pro uh, a program that has nothing to do with CRISPR. But uh, when it comes to CRISPR, we do have CRISPR Therapeutics and Vice-Sites program that we're expecting to get data, I think, anytime soon at this point. We should be getting data from Health Canada for their program that they've gotten designation for in Canada between Viasite and CRISPR Therapeutics. Just as a reminder, Viasite has already been in this space with their two other programs, but with the third program that are specifically partnering up with CRISPR Therapeutics is basically, um, is basically what you're seeing on the screen. Implemented pouch is meant to encourage surrounding blood vessel growth. And uh, I made a whole video on this on type 1 diabetes and why I think it's extremely powerful what they're doing. It's amazing. Um, type 1 diabetes is one thing. Then you have type 2 diabetes. In my opinion, if they can show success in this space, then CRISPR therapeutics will eventually venture to type 2 diabetes. And you have many, many people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. I made the mistake once saying that type 1 diabetes is less severe and less um, uh, less. Uh, lethal than type 2 diabetes that is a mistake they're both extremely uh, problematic in society we have no alternatives i mean the alternatives like iv fusions or like you do these uh, uh, whatever like obviously people that know diabetic people know exactly what they go through it's just crazy how in 2022 with the technology we have today we can't even get and rally behind a tool that can perhaps you know one-time treatment or maybe a two-time treatment right or maybe a yearly treatment that would be better than every single day you put in like a machine to track your uh, glucose level i just think it's it's crazy right so it is what it is uh so oh uh let's remove that so we have an infectious disease here this is a uti this is i've not covered this because this is a private company that is uh that is doing that uh, it's a low-cost biosciences completed the us-based phase 1b trial in february 2021 I haven't really covered this company or this space at all, but clearly here, Anderson believed that this should be mentioned here and it is a clinical trial happening. Again, I try not to follow these private companies because you know it's there's so much right now going on with public companies that I can't just spend my time looking at private companies and institutions and, and plus data is always limited in those spheres because they're, they're not obliged to disclose that information, right? So they're only gonna disclose information that you wanna see, right? And it makes sense, it's a private company, right? They don't have to. Uh, that's the whole deal of going public, right? You you get shareholders' money, public money. You raise money, you can invest in it. But uh, as an uh, as a trade off, what you're trading it is transparency, right? You have to disclose information. And to me, private companies don't have to do that, which is good the good thing or bad thing depends on which side you're on, right? Um, so yeah, so they're doing that. And then there's the HIV space, which actually I made a, a video uh, about this private company that actually is treating this through CRISPR, uh, Exition Biosciences, uh, actually Moderna as well, not CRISPR technology, but Moderna is entering in the HIV space as well, shortly after this announcement from Exition Biosciences. So I think that's very novel. I think that's amazing, the HIV side of things. Uh, I think, uh, like I said, you know, this, this is gonna blow things out of, uh, out of the waters this year, right? I think there's gonna be a lot of amazing thing happening in this space. Um, the ATTR disease, which obviously is all about NTLA therapeutics, which we've not covered in this uh, video so far, but NTLA is obviously all about ATTR. They're entering phase two uh, trial for NTLA 2001. And we know that because they've decided their dosage is gonna be 80 milligrams per, uh, for the dosage. And they've got an amazing data. I think uh, the reduction of TTR proteins has been just amazing. Uh, no serious side effects for patients, for all 15 patients. Um, so I think it's just amazing what they're doing. I think the leadership at NTLA knows exactly what they're doing. So kudos to them. Kudos to everybody at NTLA. Keep up the good work and we'll see how phase two goes. But to me, when you're getting 80, 84, 96% of change from baseline TTR protein percentage, I think, um, you know, numbers don't lie. You know, I'll leave it off like that. I think NTLA is the leading company in CRISPR space for a reason. Uh, with their in vivo approach, but they also have other programs that they have in the pipeline that they're planning to file for IND and start clinical trials. So uh, again, kudos to NTLA, amazing job at uh, the leadership there and for all stakeholders and shareholders involved, congratulations for uh, this year so far. And then you have the inflammatory disease. I think that one is an interesting one. 
Um, again, uh, it's another thing that uh, NTLA is actually working on as well. So uh, clearly here there is, a, say, some uh, traction. Uh, we'll see how it goes. NTLA is definitely all over this uh, with their one of their programs. So we'll see how it goes. Um, so, um, and I think this the big picture here, the, you know, Anderson concludes it, but that we have so much so much things to achieve right now, right? It, although we've treated some patients with, such as Victoria Gray, Jimmy that we've interviewed in the channel and other patients. And so although we have had data so far for CRISPR companies that are actually those patients so far, a total of over 175 patients so far across the globe in private, public companies. We don't know about private companies. They don't have to disclose that information, but clearly there's a lot of patients that have been dosed. This technology is here to stay. The big picture is there's still a lot of, lot of room of improvement. I mean, just for Victoria Gray, the treatment was like, I think $2 million. That is not sustainable. That is not scalable. That is not the end goal here. You wanna reduce those costs, but it makes sense. She was the first patient to be dosed. It's gonna take some time, right? Um, other than that, you know, the delivery methods need to improve as well. There's some uh, things that are a little bit toxic that intrude toxicity that you want to improve. Uh, whether, you know, whether or not CRISPR-Cas9 first generation or base editing or prime editors will remain, which won't be more dominant. I'm, I'm not really worried about that question. What I really want right now, my, my focus is on CTA001 and on the other clinical trials that we have right now from NTLA 2001, for example, or CBO10 from Caribou, what is the data gonna look like? What is the FDA is gonna do? At some point, the FDA will have to approve these drugs. They will have to look at this space seriously and reduce delays, reduce costs, which is what Cures 2.0 Act is doing. So clearly some positive results so far, amazing news. Unfortunately, the only negative side of things here is the stock prices of these companies. Things have gone down, but again, this video is not about the stock price, but what are about the CRISPR landscape, the progress of these clinical trials in 2022. Let me know in the comments below what you guys think about the clinical trials. Let me know what you guys think about this article. Do you think we are close for an FDA approved drug potentially end of this year, early 2023? Let me know. Thank you so much for watching. Have a beautiful Sunday and I will see you in the next video. Thank you.